Fox News has confirmed that NORTHCOM has a proposal sitting on the desk of Secretary of Defense Robert Gates that would authorize the military to back up FEMA should there be an H1N1 pandemic. Right now about 3,000 cases of H1N1 across Florida, about 30 deaths, but the chief of pandemic planning for the state of Florida said things could get a lot worse. In case the government asks FEMA for help, the government will be, will be ready there with the, with the military, we're told. The acting head of the CDC said he fully expects deaths from this infection. We are closely monitoring the emerging cases of swine flu in the United States. And once he declares an emergency, he can authorize non-healthcare licensed personnel, read that to mean police, sure. to vaccinate people against their will. Now, can they force adults to take vaccination? No. They will incarcerate adults without a trial, without charges, without even a search warrant, who refuse to be uh, vaccinated. This is obviously a cause for concern and requires a heightened state of alert. There have been two more H1N1 related deaths in Rhode Island. 36 children have died from the virus. 76 children have died from the H1N1 virus since April. The government now believes roughly 8 million children have come down with the virus. The infection is spreading. Well, stockpiling vaccines, closing schools, and letting government employees work from home. Prepare, don't panic. They say the best way to prepare is to have your family vaccinated. The vaccine appears to be safe. The Obama administration is considering implementing a new fall vaccination program against the flu. Composed of mercury and it's been proven to cause not only Guillain-Barre syndrome but also autism. President Obama has now declared the H1N1 virus to be a national emergency. The White House says the president signed this proclamation last night. It will allow medical officials to bypass certain federal requirements. To ensure that we have the resources we need at our disposal to respond quickly and effectively. The bill gives the public health commissioner the discretion to respond to an outbreak of the kind going on in Mexico, to close or evacuate buildings, enter private property, isolate or quarantine people. The idea there that we're going to forcibly quarantine people is absolutely absurd. They even allow authorities to forcefully enter the homes of citizens suspected of having the virus. The following area is now a military quarantine zone. Please do not attempt to leave your home. Mobile vaccination units are standing by. I believe that the, th the mar threat of martial law and FEMA camps is a real threat. I believe that our administration and the prior administration is, has been setting this country, staging the country to pave the way to martial law by creating pandemic scares or whatever it is to induce, uh, to induce this hysteria. A pandemic means in multiple regions across borders. If you have one person who's sick in Mexico and one person who's sick in the United States, they can declare a pandemic. But in the people's minds, uh, it, it conjures up the image of an epidemic, which is in one nation, but generally is associated with widespread numbers of illnesses and deaths. Pandemic scenarios are a convenient and effective way of carrying out mandatory vaccinations and for making the realization of mandatory quarantine camps a reality. The World Health Organization is holding emergency meetings and may declare a worldwide pandemic. At that level, trade could be restricted, sports events and concerts could be canceled, and borders could be closed. They can show up at your house and say, this is a quarantine area and you have to leave. And if you say, no, I don't want to, then you're subject to arrest and deportation to a detention center where then you will say, they'll say you need to be inoculated. And if you say, I don't want to be, you can be forcibly inoculated. Just like under the Freedom Commission, they're talking about education. And uh, it's quickly getting to the point to where if you choose not to inoculate your children, they can uh, have legal sanctions against you. Um, the basic problem here is, is that this is just uh, makes a mockery of freedom. There's a lot of what if going on here as well. You know, what if, what if gun control? What, 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 what if martial law? What if they disrupt the chain of command? Is there any proof on either side of anything going on? Absolutely none whatsoever. Today in New Orleans, they got a lot tougher on the holdouts. Police department, you are home! Not only the flooded areas, but New Orleans' driest and wealthiest neighborhoods, too. 
Police department! The police and National Guard going street by street, house to house. We need to make sure, too, that uh, whenever we knock on the doors, people refuse to leave. We need to make note, call it in. So they say, but we want to stop these things before they happen. But at the same time, the question has to be asked, are they planting seeds in people's minds uh, that uh, these things could develop when really there's no likelihood that any of this is going to happen? Sometimes entering open houses with guns drawn and instructions to disarm anyone inside. You said guns, guns will be taken. Yeah, no one will be able to be armed. We yes, will sir. take all yes, weapons. Sir. That happened today in this wealthy neighborhood where homeowners had armed themselves to protect their mansions. <laughs> Residents were handcuffed on the ground. They were a little bit threatened because our weapons were bigger than their weapons. For many of the police and guard troops, it is an uncomfortable job to do this in an American city. I don't want you in here, period. But there's a mandatory evacuation. I know all about it. All of a sudden, they were banging on the front door, the side door, and the back door, and they said, let us in. Patty tried to explain. She was on dry land, she had plenty of food and water, and didn't want to abandon her dogs. But it didn't matter. If you see six or eight, police that look like linebackers pushing me in a corner, you're, you're in shock. I'm saying, look at all my food. I got plenty of food. They kept pushing me back, pushing me back, and ended up like this. Well, the Trisha Coney's protests were to no avail. Um, they moved her out of there. We've activated our National Guard and our statewide uh, fire and emergency services, and we're going to be bringing those in to uh, relieve the city forces uh, as the afternoon goes on. Also in Massachusetts, the legislature is acting rapidly on a bill updating what the state can do at a public health emergency. Massachusetts proposing legislation that would allow police to forcefully quarantine residents and even impose martial law without a warrant. The state of Massachusetts, the, both houses of the legislature have enacted this law and once Governor Deval Patrick signs it and he says that he will, it'll become the law and it will allow him to declare an emergency and once he declares an emergency he can authorize non-health care licensed personnel read that to mean police sure. to vaccinate people against their will now can they force adults to take vaccination no they will incarcerate adults without a trial without charges without even a search warrant who refuse to be uh, vaccinated this is what the statute authorizes it also authorized the statute uh, the statute also authorized the police to remove Move children from adults, vaccinate them against the will of the child and the will of the parent. Evacuees are flooding this embarkation center. Now, despite the large number of people and pets, things are running very smoothly. Now, this efficiency can be attributed to a technology solution brought on by Radiant RFID, which uses RFID wristbands and RFID portals. The jurisdiction is able to get an accurate manifest on every single person getting on the bus just by walking them through this simple portal. Pets and critical medical equipment belonging to the evacuees pass through this RFID portal and are immediately added to the manifest as well. Bus loading personnel no longer need to scan each person on the bus with a barcode system like this one, a process that can be consuming when time is of the essence. All right, guys. Armed Ghost 1984 here with you on Monday, June the 29th. I'm cruising down the road and lo and behold, what did I come across? Look at this bad boy. Woo! How you like that? Brunswick County Emergency Services. Mass evacuation bus. Are you guys kidding me? Mass evacuation bus. What on earth is this thing all about? The Military Commissions Act, one of the names that went by was HR 6166, if I recall. And that was the, the last Congress in the Bush administration passed that one. And that allowed for Americans to be secretly rounded up with no trial and secretly even executed. Uh, and that also had discussion of detain and, uh, detention and 
in that legislation. And I remember when that came out, I said, this is, uh, I, I can't believe that America's uh, involved with something like this. Who knows who cares? My thing I don't care is who am I going to ask? Am I going to test it? Am I going to use it on my dog, my kid? My, and you know, that's not the point. I don't care how safe and effective it is. That was not the point. It was to have the government was going to force an elixir inside my flesh without my willing consent. Not going to happen. In 1999, I uh, enrolled in the uh, local police academy, it's, which is put out through Drury University, and it's uh, to get your state certification as a peace officer in the state of Missouri. I graduated from that in the year 2000 uh, and became a state certified peace officer. You know, there's a lot of uh, legal training of, of what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. Um, there's many, many hours of that type of training. Of course, there's also your firearms training, hand-to-hand uh, uh, -hand combat training, defensive driving, uh, use of baton, use of shotguns, use of handguns, uh, takedown tactics, uh, domestic violence uh, training, uh, working with DWI and uh, narcotics. I've uh, received training on all of those areas. Uh, I was uh, working for one of the local hospitals as a security officer and my supervisor notified me that there was a training opportunity. A team was being formed with Homeland Security and uh, they asked me to be part of this team and so I'm uh, hoping to get some extra training and also see an insight of what actually was going on with Homeland Security. I, I accepted the offer and volunteered to be on this team. All they told us that it would be training on uh, chemical, nuclear, and biological terrorism. We've been taught for several years uh, that nuclear, chemical, biological agents and effects are out there by several of our enemies to use at any given time. They showed a lot of slides of, of police officers or firemen uh, dealing with a, a chemical fire or dealing with a, some type of chemical spill. So they would show pictures of of bodies, you know, either still alive or dead that uh, had been exposed to different weapons uh, so that they kind of that fear factor started setting in and they were letting us know that how serious this was. Now to the latest on H1N1 and new figures showing a fourfold increase in its death toll. Well, stockpiling vaccines, closing schools and letting government employees work from home. Desperate times now calling for desperate measures in the Sunshine State. Florida health officials preparing for five million possible swine flu cases. Primarily our job as law enforcement would be to uh, remove the people from their homes. Um, they told us that there would be usually the city buses or school buses would be uh, brought into the neighborhoods. We would go door to door in teams and we would evacuate the people from their homes and take them to a decontamination area. Uh, they told us that this would be uh, a rough thing for us to do, that we needed to uh, prepare ourselves physically and mentally for the fact that we are removing people from their homes, that a lot of people aren't going to want to go. They, they, don't, they may not realize that there's some type of danger out there, they told us, and that it would be for their greater good for us to take them to these decontamination areas for their safety. So um, we uh, talked about it have to actually go door to door, knock on the door, explain to them what's going on, that they need to come with us so that for their safety so they can be decontaminated because they may already be exposed. Um, and they told us that, you know, people aren't going to want to leave their home. But this is not an option, that once the orders are given uh, that a mass evacuation must happen, that it has now become law. If you've been diagnosed with probable or presumed 2009 H1N1 or swine flu in recent months, you may be surprised to know this. The odds are you didn't have H1N1 flu. In fact, you probably didn't have flu at all. We were told that takedown tactics would be necessary. Uh, some of these people will not go willingly. We must take them down. Uh, of course, they brought out most uh, law enforcement are familiar with the uh, zip tie handcuffs, the plastic zip tie handcuffs, and that's what we would be using because they're cheap and easy to use. And uh, take someone down, handcuff them, remove them out of their home, and place them in the to the bus that would be awaiting on the street to uh, take them out. They also talked to us about uh, the fact that a lot of homeowners uh, have a weapon in the home. Uh, 
especially in this area. I mean, this is a, uh, southwest Missouri, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's a fairly gun-friendly state, and they warned us about that, that there's going to be homeowners that may have a gun in the home or may have a gun on their person. Uh, so be prepared uh, to use tasers, uh, pepper spray, and possibly even lethal force. But there were four of them with rifles and holding on us with our hands in the air until they got in our boat. So they got on the boat and they asked us, do you have any loaded weapons? Yes, we do. They're in the two back compartments. Wayne went to show them where the gun was. And he screams, don't touch it. Don't even move. I'll get it. We've removed them from their homes. We put them on a bus. The bus goes to a designated uh, quarantine area, which might be the local hospital. It might be a local church. might be the local school or a local community center. The buses would pull in. There would be armed security already there. Uh, we would remove the people off of the buses and they would get in a line in front of that tent and that's where they would go in to be decontaminated. Local, state, federal and private agencies, they are all taking part in a week-long domestic emergency response exercise. They're testing their ability to respond to multiple disasters in the Chicago area. Our job would be to go around the building, find every exit and make sure that it's secure with chains and padlocks so that there would only be one entrance and one exit only. You're looking at behind me is the triage area that is being set up to deal with the victim. The people get off of the buses, we line them up. Then they told us, and this was the part that really started bothering me, that before they can enter this uh, decontamination area, they must be stripped naked so that they can be decontaminated. And they said that, you know, people are not going to want to do this. It could be snowing outside, it could be sleeting, it could be raining, it does not matter. They must be stripped down naked. Uh, an officer on either side of the line, right at the entrance of these tents, armed, ordering someone to remove their clothing. If they did not remove them, they were taken to the ground, handcuffed, and the clothing would be removed uh, by force. So they're stripped down naked, possibly handcuffed, and then it's inside of that tent is going to be like an assembly line of sorts. You've got two or three different stations. The first one, they come in and they hose them down. Now, everyone working in this, and these are the, going to be your medical staff and your first responder uh, staff, and they're in moon suits, non-rebreather moon suits. Um, they hose them down. They have uh, large scrub brushes, and this is something afterwards we did in training of how to do this. It, you'd have a bucket with you know soap and water and they would clean you down um, they would go to the you know kind of move you down to the next person and they would rinse you off uh, next person would dry you off uh, and then at the end you would receive a vaccination they specifically told us that that there would be most likely in every scenario there would be vaccinations given because they don't know what you may have come in contact with. Now, did they go into detail of what that vaccine would be? No, they did not. But they did say that there would be vaccinations and then they would receive clothing, which uh, most likely would be some type of uh, jumpsuit or hospital type scrubs like you would see at a jail. They are given those and then they're escorted inside the building where they will stay. That they would be there until released by the local government or they would be there until they would be removed to uh, transfer to another sec more secure facility. They didn't go into detail um, of what type of more secure facility but I guess you could use your imagination of, of what we're talking about. And I'm sitting there and, and I was trying to figure out, I'm thinking, why, why the vaccinations? I mean, there, there could be some things if it was a pandemic virus. Uh, maybe I could see that, but most vaccines need to be given before you're exposed to the virus for them to work. You, you, know, you don't get uh, the flu and then get the flu vaccine. It usually doesn't work that way. It's usually beforehand that you have to get it. But they, they said several times that at the end of this decontamination line, you would be given a vaccine, you would be given clothing, uh, and then taken into the quarantine area. Under a program sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security, police officers were trained to go door to door, removing people from their homes with deadly force if necessary, escorting the people to school buses and being delivered to a decontamination area, usually at a school or local church, where the subjects will be hosed down, scrubbed down, 
given a series of vaccinations and held prisoner until they can be transferred to a more secure facility. The Department of Homeland Security has these programs embedded in the policing communities across the United States, just waiting for orders to be given. First of all, there is no constitutional validation for rounding people up, detoxing them, mandatory vaccinations, and then sending them to secure facilities. I mean, that whole description is exactly what they did to the Jews during the Holocaust. I mean, we round them up, we, you know, give them group showers, we give them mandatory vaccinations, and, you know, at the end of that tour, you know, they put you in ovens. I, I mean, waiting until you're walking into the oven, that's too late to complain. You know, if you didn't complain a lot sooner than that, I mean, you lose. Months before the swine flu vaccine was even released, we were receiving reports from across the United States that public schools were forcibly inoculating school children with a seasonal flu vaccine, telling parents it was the law. They're doing vaccinations in the schools, there are clinics in the schools, there are nurses in the schools. When parents went to court, they found out that it wasn't the law, and the schools then backed off saying, oh, it was just an accident. Now we're seeing a replay of that, where schools across the United States, from Kentucky to New York, are forcibly inoculating children with the H1N1 flu vaccine even when their parents have instructed them not to do so. And again, when the schools get caught, they say, oops, we made a mistake. What's happening is, in years past, there's been a massive backlash against the hundreds of vaccines that are being pushed against the population. The Gardasil shot for supposed cervical cancer, the MMR, the rising rates of autism from 1 in 25,000 20 years ago to 1 in 96 today. And so because there is this big backlash, they're hyping the H1N1 really as an excuse to try to set the precedent to forcibly inoculate the population. That's what's really happening here. The main thing that we looked at, all I wanted to know was can Arizona use legislation in some way to forcibly inoculate an individual resident. You know, that's all I wanted to know. Where is that information? Finally, we did get a call. I got a call at home, as a matter of fact, from a representative from the Arizona Department of Health. And what they said was, is they go, yes, there is a plan. And they finally gave me on the net where it was. So I went there and I started looking at it. What they had done is they had a mechanism in place waiting for a declaration of emergency from the federal government. At this time, you remember that the World Health Organization was giving us the highest rating the entire planet was going to fall ill. Well, that didn't really happen. It was just a trigger for the national government here in the United States to declare a national emergency. That triggered the ability of the governors to be able to declare a state emergency that would enact a bunch of provisions in this plan. Well, part of this plan was is that they would have forced inoculations. We preempted it by going out and doing a lot of video, talking to a lot of people, and making sure that we were in support of the first responders not being inoculated, support first responders that say no to mandatory shots. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we understood was what mechanism were they going to use to be able to have some kind of an excuse to strap you down and give you a shot. Well, we found it. What they did is in place, as there already is, for extreme DUIs, people that are alcoholics and drive uh, automobiles, they have a court system and a treatment system in place to where you go to the um, uh, court system and a judge can order treatment. Well, that court and that medical care is what they were riding on in order to be able to have a mechanism of people in white lab coats to be able to give you a shot. Well, in the legislation, it said, those that choose to refuse being inoculated for religious reasons can do so but they have to get on the bus. You have to be quarantined from everybody else that's going to get their shots. And if you don't want to get a shot, not a problem. Get on the bus. 
this gives them the ability, you know, one single unelected official gives the ability to strip you of all of your rights. You can be taken into custody for, you know, for purposes of treatment or examination. Uh, you can be forcibly vaccinated against your will. I mean, the cops would come to your house, you know, take you away and, and people would forcibly vaccinate you. Um, you could be put into isolation or quarantine at one of these facilities, you know, and, and you know, like they said, it's, there's no big sign out front that says FEMA concentration camp. Well, interesting, what else the vaccination could do is they could chip you. They could put in that vaccination, they have chips so small that they can go inside those vaccination. That could be another thing they could be doing is saying, oh, we want to give you this N1, H1 vaccination to save you from some disease. But really they're doing is they're chipping you without you knowing it. There's a lot of people out there that may be critics of the Marines actually doing uh, training in American cities. Uh, you know, the whole, the posse comitatus uh, question and, and that type of thing. Um, what are your thoughts on or um, house to house gun confiscation or, or if the Marines would ever have to do that in America? I really don't want to speculate on that. That's uh, I'm a corporal in the Marine Corps. Um, posse comitatus applies to law enforcement and that's not something that the Marine Corps is in the business to do. We're, we are America's 911 force in readiness, especially in the 26 MU. Uh, we train on American soil in order to prepare ourselves to deploy into the rest of the world. Uh, the reason we're here is for urban training to, to use wherever we may need it. The federal requirements that are being waived for the H1N1 national emergency is the First Amendment to the Constitution, which is all about civil rights, life, liberty, pursuits of happiness, freedom of religion, and equal protection under the law. All of these are being trumped by this declaration of national emergency by the executive office, which actually follows suit with the state's model state emergency health powers acts that have been advanced throughout the states to virtually do the same thing. The model state's emergency health powers act was presented to Congress in 2001. Um, the purpose of it was to update um, public health laws and it was right after the anthrax scare, and so bioterrorism was an aspect of that. Uh, the thought was that we needed to modernize our public health laws for you know, new considerations like bioterrorism. The purpose of it was to create a template for the states, to give to the state legislators, to update, modernize, or harmonize their laws. And of course, there was financial incentives added to that. As far as I can tell, most states have adopted them in full or in part. Uh, and the problem with it is, is that it gives real, it gets overbroad power to the governors and an unelected health official, usually your health commissioner, to take your property, to quarantine or isolate you or your property, uh, to force treatment, examination against your will, and it also involves the police. Um, in Oklahoma, the, the commissioner may issue an order for the examination of any individual under the suspicion or confirmation that said individual has a communicable disease. So in other words, on one man's word that he suspects you have a communicable disease, um, you can be taken in and examined against your will and then it goes to treatment. The commissioner may issue an order for the treatment of any individual suspected or confirmed to have a communicable disease. The commissioner may also order the treatment of any individual or individuals exposed to certain infectious agents. So in administrative rules, we find that uh, the commissioner of health, who's an unelected official, he can issue an order for examination of any individual or group of individuals um, based upon suspicion or confirmation that they've been exposed to a communicable disease. Treatment, they can order um, upon suspicion or confirmation uh, that someone's been exposed to a communicable disease. They can order the treatment and it just says treatment. It doesn't define that. So based on the health commissioner's idea of what you need to be treated with. It could be a vaccination, it could be anything. Um, isolation or quarantine, they can isolate or quarantine you based on suspicion or, or um, if you're reasonably known or suspected to have a communicable disease. Quarantine, same thing. 
And uh, another thing that is really worrisome about this is that private property. Um, I think your body is probably the most private of property that you own, and that's out the window, but so is your real property. So the commissioner may issue an order to quarantine a facility, a complex, a campus, so any premises basically. They can shut it down. Property, people, everything. When they made preparations for mandatory vaccinations, this was done by Homeland Security with every state. Calves are the source of smallpox vaccine. Cattle are subject to a weakened form of smallpox called cowpox. Large quantities of vaccine are produced by infecting healthy calves like this one with live cowpox virus. The virus multiplies rapidly and by the fifth day, crusts have formed on the skin wherever the calf was infected. These crusts are collected. They contain the live germs which will serve as vaccine for human beings. Glycerin is added as a preservative and to provide a vaccine in fluid form. From this mixture, individual doses of the vaccine are prepared. The vaccine may be supplied in a capillary tube like this and applied directly to the skin from the tube. The feds were already quietly hyping the fear in local governments in January of 2009, four months before the outbreaks began in Mexico. But even in Mexico, you only had a few deaths. Why was all this fear being generated by the mainstream media? The Obama administration declared a public health emergency after 40 cases of swine flu were confirmed. This is obviously a cause for concern and requires a heightened state of alert. And the U.S. has started to test a swine flu vaccine on children and adults. There's a bit of a rush to test a new flu vaccine. Now, like you said, about 12,000 children in Oklahoma are going to be tested with this vaccine to see what the side effects are going to be. And like you said, here in the United States, we call that being a guinea pig. They basically use the scare tactic, which I call the chicken little theory. The chicken little theory is the sky is falling. They keep saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And the media, which I is part of the problem because the media is basically a spokesperson for the U.S. government. It tells the people whatever they want to hear. And the government basically uses the chicken little theory by telling the media, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to occur. And then the people get scared. They say 36 children have died from the virus in the United States. Seven of those children under the age of five. The average age, nine years old. 76 children have died from the H1N1 virus since April, including 19 in the last week alone. We've learned that there have been two more H1N1 related deaths in Rhode Island. Today's numbers are about four times higher than what the CDC reported just six days ago. The government now believes roughly 8 million children have come down with the virus. In addition to the 540 who have died, 36,000 have been hospitalized. The Centers for Disease Control this past week quadrupled its estimated H1N1 flu virus death toll to roughly 3,900. More than 4,000 Americans have died after coming down with H1N1. U.S. public health officials say they are now moving forward aggressively, preparing for this flu epidemic to become much more severe. The acting head of the CDC said he fully expects deaths from this infection. All of the media hype and fear-mongering that we've seen worldwide associated with the pandemic of 2009-2002 with the H1N1 novel flu virus has been completely unwarranted. The regular seasonal flu kills over 36,000 people according to the CDC. There had only been a few deaths in the United States when a worldwide pandemic was announced. So you have to ask yourself, why all the hype? We're just hearing from CDC officials, uh, Dr. Ian Shuchet said that they are seeing a decline in the number of H1N cases uh, on the national level. In short, 
only a small fraction of cases that doctors flagged as most likely to be swine flu actually tested positive for swine flu at state labs. The vast majority of the cases were negative. A four-year-old Rochester boy is recovering tonight after nearly dying after being vaccinated for H1N1. Now, the Centers for Disease Control says the H1N1 vaccine, like any medic medicine, could cause a serious allergic reaction. We've taken no shortcuts in terms of safety, and we're rigorously monitoring for any potential problems with the vaccine. You know, during this H1N1, it started, that's one of the powers of the Internet and information. We started finding out that around the world, we were having all kinds of problems, including, you know, almost impossible to, uh, to, to sabotage labs that were sending out vaccines that had stuff that it wasn't even possible for them, those factories to be able to put in there without sabotage or intent. What was the intent? We had third world countries that did the old school way. They were testing their vaccines on animals. They died. They went, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, it, you know, we got to thank, uh, what, Czechoslovakia for averting a worldwide pandemic? You know, this is, all of these companies have been implicated throughout history. And if it's not the same ones, it's always a big one. It's always someone that benefits enormously from an outbreak of something. That we can, if we can get just a few dollars from a few million people, we can start making some money. This is this all this collectivized medicine, collectivized cures, collectivized prevention. That is the problem. It's just the mere philosophy that we can take care of the herd, and they think that way because they think of us as livestock. A new survey shows that one-third of British nurses have said that they will not take the swine flu vaccine because they're worried about the possible side effects. I, I know from talking to people in the research community, even scientists who helped uh, develop the vaccine for smallpox are saying they're not going to take the vaccine and they're urging their friends and family not to take this vaccine either. Now the swine flu vaccine from back in the 1970s, which is supposed to be pretty similar to the one that's being offered today, has been linked to a neurological disorder called the Guillain Barre syndrome. Well, contained in the vaccine is a, 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 a component called thimerosal, which has been proven, uh, it, it, half of it is composed of mercury, and it's been proven to cause not only Guillain-Barre syndrome, but also autism in young children. In fact, right, would you give it to your kids? I definitely would not. You would not, all right, and in fairness, I've talked to three doctors in three days now, and all three have said, Absolutely, they would give it to their kids. They intend to give it to their kids. They're going to take it themselves, but you say no. I, I definitely would not. I've seen it devastate people with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, highly implicated, again, in, in autism. Um, I think you're rolling the dice. Uh, it's a proven neurotoxin. has 25,000 times the level of mercury than would be considered toxic if it was a food or water. The military is expected to put together teams across the country to deal with a possible outbreak this fall. Did you hear that, Jessica? The military, I mean, it, 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 they have some serious concerns about what's going to happen in the fall with this flu. Yep. Because we'll have two flus at once, obviously, regular old every year flu and then this, you know, pig flu. That H1N1. Yeah, in case the, <laughs> case the government asks FEMA for help, the government will be, will be ready there with the, with the military, we're told. It's as health officials race to get vaccines ready. We are suffering the exact amount of tyranny that we're allowing. The only way that we're really going to be free is when we evolve past the need and the emotional dependence on any government. The United Nations bragged that the H1N1 flu pandemic was a great drill, a global exercise preparing the planet to go under United Nations control and that all the major signatories to the World Health Organization agreements on flu pandemic were now under UN control. That's one of the main reasons that we see this being carried out. It's all a globalization, federalization drill uh, to train everyone to waive their rights and waive their liberties so that we can all be protected from this public health menace. Uh, I go down to my local Walmart and they have a clinic in there and you walk in and there's people lined up around standing outside waiting to get their vaccine. Do they know what's in that vaccine? No. Do they know that they need it? No. They're just being told that they need to go get it because they could get sick and die. So they load up the family and they run down to the local clinic and everybody gets their vaccine. I've heard rumors about Walmart being used because Walmart has all the clothes, all the food. 
they, you know, every Walmart you go into is a, you know, million square foot building and would be very convenient for sheltering people. It's like, okay, it's raining. Um, everybody run inside Walmart so that you can keep dry. And then once you get in, you know, you slam the, the gates closed. Now everybody's locked inside. Now Walmart is, is the largest company in, in the United States and in the world, I believe. Uh, with the system of uh, semi-tractor trailers and warehouses that they have, there are stores in basically every community of the United States. They have an existing infrastructure that can move a lot of property, stuff, whether it be food, water, medical supplies, ammunition. Uh, that infrastructure can move uh, literally hundreds of tons of food and ammunition and, and medical supplies very efficiently and very quickly. But it's not just preachers and the InfraGuard executives that have been recruited to help carry out this tyranny. They are now getting Walmart involved. In fact, for several years, Walmart has taken part in mass drills uh, where locals simulate coming to the Walmart parking lot where they're given a jelly bean as a symbol of their forced inoculation. Well, I can't address the FEMA camps, but I can address something very closely related, and that is the restriction of travel. And in my research, uh, which really began with looking into toll transponders being used on cars and has now expanded into looking at how tolls are being very specifically used uh, together with information uh, or, or with planning for a potential epidemic to actually create choke points to create borders of states where there would literally be no leaving a state. A state could be locked down, where we may actually be moving to a, a plan in the future where crossing the border from, say, New Hampshire into Massachusetts would be akin today to crossing the border from America to Canada. So that's really what has me very concerned. You don't really need to round people up in FEMA camps if you can simply lock them down. Uh, I'll give you one example. The city of Cambridge, uh, I recently interviewed on my radio program a city council member from Cambridge who had given back money that was used to install uh, video cameras, federal money for video cameras, at all the points of egress from Cambridge. And she said, why do we need this? And the answer was, well, in the event that we have to shut Cambridge down and keep people in, we need to know what the routes are out of the city so we can set up checkpoints and prevent people from leaving. You know, if I have the United States government telling me that there is an enormous threat, either a bacterial, alien invasion from Alpha and whatever, that there is uh, war, imminent war, uh, missiles coming, details at 11, and they are going to use anything they can to put me into a state of mind that I am willing to go to some camp, that I'm willing to be relocated, that I'm willing to be taken from my home forcibly, then they're the bad guy. It's very important to understand that when you see Barack Obama or Merkel of Germany or Brown of Britain come out and announce that their countries are under an emergency, that is done in accordance with the United Nations. And that's done so executive orders signed by all of these countries can be activated, which supersede the rights and liberties of the people and allow quarantine, forced inoculation, mass arrest, lockdown of cities. Even states have passed laws to mirror the federal and international. Texas passed a law that during an emergency they can lock you up, make you wear a bracelet, make you go to a FEMA camp. We know through the clergy response teams, they're training pastors all over the nation to tell their flocks to take the inoculations, to go to the relocation centers. Well, what, what's the difference? What's the difference between Bush and Obama? Every wrong thing that Bush was doing, Obama has taken it to the 10th power and has accelerated it and made it worse. Um, was Bush a socialist? Absolutely. Was Bush a good president? Absolutely not. Did he do things contrary to the Constitution? Absolutely. Uh, did he get us involved in foreign wars that we should not be involved in? Yes. Was he willing to compromise our freedom and security uh, and safety for his own political patty caking? Yes. When the World Health Organization declares a level six a pandemic, then all of the other mechanisms uh, engage at the you know, national, state, and local level. Um, there, there are plans through the World Health Organization at the local level that require level six before uh, some of the more draconian uh, methods can be implemented. 
Mandatory flu vaccinations or mandatory quarantines mark a pivotal role in this nation's fight against civil injustice. If a person truly has control over their own body, then how can any government force them to be inoculated against their will? With a simple declaration of a national emergency, the Constitution can be suspended indefinitely. I work over in this area, and you know, it's an industrial park, so there's not many people around. One day I'm driving around, and I see you know uh, hundreds of people walking down the sides of the road, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. Well. Uh, ran into a police officer and he said that they had uh, evacuated people from Hurricane Gustav and were housed here at the Lucent building. You know, they all had their little bracelets on and stuff and I guess if they weren't in by a certain time they got locked out. So, I mean, they had the uh, portable bathrooms in there. They had the, the, the gate where they locked them in at night and kept everybody else out. For decades, uh, there's been discussion about FEMA detention facilities and how they could be utilized. It was unclear how anybody could be rounded up because it was, uh, you know, assumed that everybody would resist on a mass scale. Well, now we're starting to see scenarios where people would actually demand that their friends and neighbors be rounded up. This is a new virus. It has skipped from one animal species to another. This has a little bit of bird, a lot of pig. It's in humans. It is new to most Americans. It is going to cut a swath through those who have no immunologic memory for it. What I worry about is that there's enough distrust of the American government, and people are a trillion out and numb over the Wall Street thing. And they're going to look at Big Pharma and go, please, just another way to make a buck. And they're going to go, don't tell me what to do. You had the h one one vaccine that was fast-tracked, skipping all but the most preliminary tests of safety and effectiveness, while at the same time, the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services signed a document that gave legal immunity to the vaccine manufacturers and officials alike. Under the provisions of a 2006 law for public health emergencies, vaccine makers and federal officials will be immune from lawsuits that result from any new swine flu vaccine. Um, then the mainstream media is reporting that uh, the military is prepared to assist civilian authorities. The military is expected to put together teams across the country to deal with a possible outbreak this fall. Fox News has confirmed that NORTHCOM has a proposal sitting on the desk of Secretary of Defense Robert Gates that would authorize the military to back up FEMA should there be an H1N1 pandemic. The proposal comes from NORTHCOM Commander Victor Renoir who wants uh, permission to set up five regional military teams who will respond if FEMA says it, it needs help. The plan called for uh, military task force to work in conjunction with FEMA. You know, at the same time they're going through all these training scenarios where military and law enforcement are facing angry citizens. There is no proof that the government is building detention camps around the country. Then about the same time you had scientists, health officials, law enforcers, first responders and other experts that gathered to discuss uh, pandemic response at the International Swine Flu Conference. The World Health Organization is holding emergency meetings and may declare a worldwide pandemic. Some of the breakout sessions included topics such as um, psychological issues, um, like unwillingness to follow government orders. And the Constitution says the police can't break into your home, right. and the police can't take your children away from you, and parents decide what medication the children get, not the government. Then in Oklahoma, we found that there are administrative rules that say that you can be forcibly vaccinated against your will. Basically, it says that you can be taken immediately into custody and uh, for the purposes of treatment or uh, examination. And once he declares an emergency, he can authorize non-health care licensed personnel, read that to mean police, sure. to vaccinate people against their will. So this means that you and your family can be forcibly vaccinated against your will, all on the orders of a single unelected official, the health commissioner. Um, this completely bypasses all uh, checks and balances. Uh, subsequent sections address the issue of uh, isolating people at home, hospitals, or alternate facilities. Well, Andrew Griffin from reddirtreport.com here in Oklahoma went looking for answers from the Oklahoma State Department of Health. He spoke to Larry Weatherford, and when asked about alternate facilities that would be utilized, Larry stated the old Lucent Technologies building in western Oklahoma City, where Hurricane Gustav evacuees were housed. Well, the Lucent Technology building is located in western Oklahoma City. It's a huge, huge building, uh, lots of open warehouse space, almost completely surrounded by barbed wire fence with secured gates that have guard shacks beside them. 
uh, and then in the back you, there's rail access you know which you know meets the, the the criteria of what people call a FEMA concentration camp I mean there's no sign out front that says FEMA concentration camp but it's one of these deals where you know it's this gray area but you know immediately that when they wanted to utilize it it could be put into effect for decades people have talked about FEMA detention facilities uh, but it's always been you know a point of contention on how people would uh, be able to be rounded up in these because everyone assumes that there would be mass resistance to it well now we're starting to see scenarios where people would actually demand that their friends and neighbors be uh, rounded up in case of a pandemic or you know be it true or false uh, at least the impression of a pandemic would be enough to initiate that type of behavior um, this is behind me is the Lucent building. It's an enormous facility, a uh, huge open warehouse space where, you know, previously uh, evacuees from Hurricane Gustav have been housed. Um, it's a large open parking lot areas here with, you know, secure fence all around, barbed wire facing in, and a railroad tracks just a few feet away. You can see where thousands of people could be staged here and loaded on the railroad tracks that are just a few feet away. Um, they've set up communications already for uh, cellular and various other networks, but you can see where that could be easily converted also in the smokestack behind us. It would only take a few military personnel in strategic locations to really lock this place down. I mean, while there's open access now, you know, it would only take a, a, you know, a, a few hours to really secure this place. Um, you know, a few, few guards and strategic points and no one would be able to leave. The flu virus or any type of biological threat is the perfect cover for martial law and control because it's something that makes everyone a potential threat. It makes everyone a potential carrier, everyone a potential terrorist carrying the terrorist virus. This helps us submit to tyranny. It helps us suspect our neighbors. It helps us see the government as our savior and the arbiter. And it divides the people against each other. Those crazy people, as the CFR has said, that don't want to take the shots versus the reasonable people that trust their government and understand that we're supposed to roll up our sleeves when we're given that order. I don't know if it's true, but I've been told that three days without food, your neighbors are willing to steal from you. And six days without food, your neighbors are ready to kill you. Well, if we create the economic collapse and just wait for a week, you know, we're going to have rampant theft, rampant, you know, assault and murder. And, well, heck, you know, that's clearly an excuse for the government to step in and reestablish law and order. The problem is they're reestablishing their law, their order, where they are in control, and any of us that, you know, disregard a direct order are now shot and killed. When the economies first started to crash, we knew what was going to happen. There was going to be a government bailout just like they did in the savings and loan scandal in the late 80s, early 90s. Here in Arizona, we took a hit. We could see the same thing was going to happen. We had really hot real estate. We had uh, the bubble was inflated as much as it could go. They were building more homes than they had people that would even go look at them. There are many triggers to institute expanded unconstitutional federal international control. And chief among those is an economic collapse. We already saw that in October of 2008 when the Congress wouldn't vote for unlimited money to be given to the very same private banks that had orchestrated the crisis. Secretary of the Treasury at the time, Paulson, went before a closed session and threatened them that martial law would be declared if they didn't submit to what J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs were doing. Many of us were told in private conversations that if we voted against this bill on Monday that the sky would fall, the market would drop two or three thousand points the first day, another couple thousand the second day, and a few members were even told that there would be martial law in America if we voted no. And now they're back to their same old tricks again, saying there's going to be a complete economic meltdown if you don't give us even more power and allow the very banks that engineered the last crisis power over all other financial institutions. 
As a senator, Obama supported the nearly trillion-dollar Bush TARP program, which gave money to insolvent banks and Wall Street businesses. When his administration took over, Obama ushered in his own trillion-dollar America Recovery and Reinvestment Act, 28% of which has been set aside for entitlements. This act was supposed to save our economy by stimulating the economy, creating jobs, and rebuilding infrastructure. Yet the financial crisis has not yet been averted. The housing markets have not recovered. Unemployment still hovers close to 10%, and according to recent figures, those living in poverty in the United States of America is expected to be nearly 15%, a figure not seen since the 1960s. While our nation's debt and gross domestic product are nearly the same percentage. The Obama administration preyed on the fears of many and forced yet another trillion dollar piece of social legislation through Congress. The Affordable Care Act will force the people of the United States to purchase health care or be fined for not having it. From my point of view, it's the health care, the Obama plan. Um, mandatory health care. If you don't have health care, you're going to be given a thousand dollar fine. And for me, one of the scariest aspects is mandatory vaccinations. Um, I worked on a cattle ranch for a period of time and every year, well, twice a year, we would get all the cattle and we would give the cattle mandatory vaccinations. And the analogy was not lost on me. You know, the government wants to treat us like cattle, wants to line us up, and wants us to take these vaccinations whether we need it or not. The way you get Americans into camps, you can't do, roundups won't be successful like they were in World War II Germany where they first disarmed the Jews and then did whatever they wanted with the Nazi soldiers. They had an easy time rounding them up. Here you can't do that because if you get people shooting back, it's, you, you know, and the word gets around this is going on, it's going to be unsuccessful. So probably in America, you'll need to have an ultra massive economic collapse to coax people to, to persuade them to come into the camps. That would be, um, so economic hardship is the way to do that. If, you, if people are starving and have nowhere to go, uh, the, the tent city will not sound as good to them as a FEMA camp. Uh, the economy being in shambles, so many people being unemployed, uh, has left a lot of people hurting, frustrated, angry, and looking for a reason why they are in the place they're in. In addition, I think that a great many people out there are very angry over things like the bank bailouts, uh, the bailout of the auto industry. You know, what they see, I think, uh, is a government simply pouring money uh, into the hands, really, of the elites, of people who then go on to get uh, bonuses of millions of dollars at the end of the year, and they don't feel uh, that what the government has done to try and end the recession is really reaching real working people. So there's a great deal of anger and frustration out there, and that is being channeled sometimes by conspiracy theories uh, or by scapegoating certain groups into this kind of rage we are seeing all across the country. The most sickening aspect of this whole homeland security system is the fact that over a million two hundred thousand Americans are on the no-fly list. No judge, no jury, no witnesses. You don't know how you got on the list. You can't get off the list. It's the benchmark, the hallmark of a tyranny that there are secret lists for dissidents. In spring of 2010, the Southern Poverty Law Center posted reports called Rage of the Right and Meet the Patriots on their website. Meet the Patriots profiles 40 individuals that the Southern Poverty Law Center sees as being at the heart of the resurgent patriot movement. Furthermore, our federal government, as well as the mainstream media, looks at the Southern Poverty Law Center as the ultimate watchdog for people that could potentially be domestic threats to our country's security. Has there been a rise in hate crimes, etc.? Well, there has definitely been, been a rise in uh, threats towards the president, in domestic terrorism aimed at the president, uh, and at hate speech essentially revolving around the idea that we have a black man and his black family in the White House. Uh, so that's undeniable. I mean, we've seen uh, skinhead assassination plots, a guy who wanted to set off a dirty bomb at the inauguration, and a whole long list. Uh, many of the cases you mentioned, uh, like the man who murdered three officers uh, in Pittsburgh, were also influenced by this uh, anti-Obama atmosphere. In his article about the Southern Poverty Law Center, Chuck Baldwin states that the information and reports disseminated by Southern Poverty Law Center 
wind up in police reports and bulletins all over the United States, pointing out that the Southern Poverty Law Center probably played a big role in the infamous February 2009 MIAC report. An anti-tax demonstration is scheduled for downtown's Keener Plaza April 15th, but charges are flying that one of the organizing groups is an extremist anti-government group. The group is the Constitution Party, and they run candidates for, among other offices, mayor of St. Louis, congressional seats, and several statewide Missouri offices. But the Anti-Defamation League, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and at one point, the Missouri Highway Patrol all labeled the Constitution Party an anti-government extremist organization. I think we'd consider it a, a fringe right-wing political party uh, that we consider to have uh, extremist roots. Last month, the Missouri Highway Patrol issued an intelligence report warning local Missouri law enforcement to keep an eye on radical organizations, and those included the Constitution Party. Several of those named in the two reports are veterans, former law enforcement officials, politicians, and even a couple of Fox News personalities. These are interspersed with a handful of independent journalists, including film producer Gary Franchi and militia members. In their spring 2010 intelligence report, the Southern Poverty Law Center claimed to have identified 512 patriot groups. The report states that being categorized as a patriot group doesn't make them an advocate of violence or hate, yet the Southern Poverty Law Center a group of self-confessed national hate watchers was quick to claim these groups are anti-government extremists. Founded by Morris Dees and Joseph Levin in 1971 for the purposes of ensuring the rights of minorities, the Southern Poverty Law Center claims to be an organization dedicated to fighting hate and bigotry and to seeking justice for the most vulnerable members of society. What would the Southern Poverty Law Center hope to gain by naming and profiling individuals in their Meet the Patriot report. Top-ranked Baldwin, Franchi, and others wonder about the possibility that the Southern Poverty Law Center is a front organization for Big Brother. These patriots are in the forefront fighting for this nation's constitutional rights. The Southern Poverty Law Center seems bent on demonizing any American citizen or group who feels that the federal government is not adhering to this country's ultimate law, the Constitution. That FEMA, for instance, is running a secret series of concentration camps in order to imprison Americans. Or that President Obama is secretly planning re-education camps uh, for our children. Those kinds of ideas, certainly not in all cases, but in yeah. some percentage of cases, drive people to feel that they have to defend their kind of freedoms, their liberty, at the point of a gun. The Southern Poverty Law Center labels patriots as people who generally believe that the federal government is an evil entity that is engaged in a secret conspiracy to impose martial law. Specifically, where do you get proof, uh, aside from some isolated incidents, that this is a growing trend across the country? Sure, fair enough question. I, I don't think it's at all isolated. We've got not only reports, all kinds of evidence uh, of these groups actually doing training in the woods as they did back in the 90s. Completely overlooked by the Southern Poverty Law Center is information published in an article in the now defunct Radar magazine. In the article, the last roundup is government compiling a secret list of citizens to detain under martial law. Christopher Ketchum reports that the continuity of government program encompasses national emergency plans that would trigger the takeover of the country by extra constitutional forces. In short, it's a roadmap for martial law. No one knows very much about the continuity of government program. Representative and Homeland Security Committee Chairman Benny Thompson and committee member Pete DeFazio sought to review the documents, but were denied pressing DeFazio to go public, stating, maybe the people who think there's a conspiracy out there are right. Ketchum also talks about MainCore, a database that a knowledgeable source says contains information on 8 million Americans. Specifically, Ketchum quotes his source as saying, the database can identify and locate perceived enemies of the state almost instantaneously. In the event of a national emergency, these people could be subject to everything from heightened surveillance and tracking to direct questioning and possibly even detention. Resurgent patriots understand that the definition of a national emergency remains rather vague. 
According to Department of Defense documents and past executive orders, it could be as simple as riots or natural disasters to the more complex insurrections or nationwide opposition to a U.S. military invasion overseas. Resurgent patriots are also concerned with the warrantless electronic surveillance and spying programs during which the federal government bypassed existing laws to data mine the communications of American citizens on U.S. soil. This information, along with information from other sources, gives the so-called resurgent patriots and patriot groups credibility, plausible reason for concern, and paints a sinister picture of the Southern Poverty Law Center an organization out not to protect the most vulnerable members of society, but to suppress, degrade, and list anyone who openly questions the federal government's actions. Another controversial report and more damage control from the Department of Homeland Security. The same department that issued a report suggesting returning war veterans were susceptible to extremist groups, also issuing what it calls the, quote, domestic extremism lexicon. In quote. It's like a dictionary with definitions for various extremist or terrorist groups and some definitions. Uh, here's an entry. Anti-immigration extremism. The Department of Homeland Security's definition. People who are, quote, highly critical of the U.S. government's response to illegal immigration and oppose government programs that are designed to extend rights to illegal aliens such as driver's licenses and in-state tuition. Here's another one. Single-issue extremist groups. According to the DHS dictionary, there are individuals who focus on a single cause, such as animal rights or the environment. They are also described as special interest extremists. But the reality is the Department of Homeland Security is supposed to be defending us against another attack from Islamic terrorism. That's the reason this department was created. And yet, it appears to be the gang that can't shoot straight. And also, to me, it's missing its purpose. Uh, you went through all those different definitions of uh, a different type of extremists. Nowhere in that dictionary do you see the term Islamic extremist. It came to light last week that the state of Pennsylvania paid an Israeli-based company, the Institute of Terrorism Research and Response, $125,000 to compose a list of opponents of gas drilling and tax protesters to fulfill the State Department of Homeland Security federal mandate. When the matter was brought to the attention of Pennsylvania Governor Ed Rendell, he claimed to be appalled and embarrassed that his office was tracking and circulating information about legitimate protests. At a press conference, he made this declaration. Let me make this as clear as I can make it. Protesting against an idea, a principle, a process is not a real threat against infrastructure. Protesting is a God-given American right, a right that is in our Constitution, a right that is fundamental to all we believe in as Americans. Well, unless, of course, you were protesting against the G20 in the governor's state last year. I think whenever you begin to look at what took place under the regime of Adolf Hitler, what took place in, under Mao's China and, and Stalin's Russia, and on and on, the pattern of before you can persecute a people, before you can incarcerate large numbers of people, you have to marginalize them. Uh, you have to create the image uh, that these people are dangerous to society or they're extremists or radicals, call them what you will but marginalize them from the mainstream of society so that at that point uh, the rest of society will accept the persecution that might result upon this group. In June 2010, enemy of the Constitution-loving Americans and MSNBC's hardball host Chris Matthews 
did a piece on the Tea Party movement, Oath Keepers, Alex Jones, Militias, Birthers, and other Patriot groups referring to them as the New Right. He says, this new movement grew from a group having mere political differences with the left to a group enraged at the Obama administration, considering the federal government an occupying force rather than a legitimate administration and seems to harbor class and racial resentment. Matthews is also concerned with, as he puts it, their need for their Second Amendment rights. Matthews takes great offense to the adoption of the Gadsden flag as the symbol of the group saying it scares him. In an interview about his documentary, Rise of the New Right, Matthews points out that there were even congressmen and congresswomen on the balcony of the Capitol building, waving the Gadsden flag and inciting the crowd to protest the federal government. In the documentary, he takes his opportunity to point out the common thread running through these new writers, a fear that their personal rights are being threatened their dislike of our nation's economic situation, government overspending, the huge national debt, and their dislike of what they see as America becoming. Matthew seems to forget that in the United States of America, we do have the right to be distressed, question authority, protest egregious acts committed by the federal government, and yes, to be armed. FEMA has been given the authority to declare martial law wherever they are deployed. And that is a very powerful, powerful uh, authority in that, as you should know, when martial law is declared that your constitutional rights are dismissed. New questions tonight about an Army combat brigade being trained to deal with civil disturbances in the United States. The Posse Comitatus Act of 1878 generally prohibits federal uniformed services from carrying out domestic law enforcement duties, except in cases expressly authorized by the Constitution or an act of Congress. Critics say the brigade's training goes against one of the founding principles of our country, separation of military and civilian government. They've spent 30 months on the streets of Baghdad. Now the 1st Brigade combat team of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division is back in the USA. The Army Times reporting, quote, they may be called upon to help with civil unrest and crowd control or to deal with potentially horrific scenarios, end quote. May be called upon to help with civil unrest and crowd control. The question arises, why? And isn't that what the National Guard does? Infantry Brigade is designed to engage an enemy with maximum effective force and destroy it. That's not the sort of thing anybody wants to see in, in the streets of the United States. Almost 5,000 strong, the brigade is based at Fort Stewart, Georgia, under control of Northern Command. One of its specialties is counterinsurgency. This is a radical departure from separation of civilian law enforcement and military authority and could, quite possibly, represent a violation of law. Historically, the posting is unusual. In modern history, Army troops have been used at extraordinary junctures under the first President Bush to contain the 1992 riots in Los Angeles, under President Lyndon Johnson in response to Detroit's 1967 riots, and in the grips of a depression by President Herbert Hoover to contain Army veterans demanding their bonuses. The United States of America were generally isolationists during World War II. Wanting to gain citizen support to get involved in the war, Lieutenant Commander Arthur McCollum drafted his eight-action memo in October 1940, the purpose of which was to provoke a Japanese attack against the United States, causing U.S. citizens to demand entry into the war. The actions caused the desired effect, resulting in the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. In March 1962, the Joint Chiefs of Staff drafted a plan to create public support for a war with Cuba. Operation Northwoods called for the CIA and other such groups to carry out terroristic attacks against U.S. bases and cities and implicating Cuba by planting false evidence. According to the records, the plans were never implemented, but they do bear a striking resemblance to the attacks of September the 11th, 2001. The official account of the September 11th attacks has been the source of ongoing debate for more than nine years. The video and photographic evidence does not support the official story. 
Former Florida Senator Bob Graham stated that there was information that had not been made available to the public for which there are specific, tangible, credible answers, and that the cover-up led to the heart of the administration. The crisis of September the 11th saw a major shift in security and other legislation and has nearly single-handedly brought about the end of privacy in the United States. USA Patriot Acts 1 and 2 intruded on no less than five of the first ten Bill of Rights. The John Warner Defense Act saw the end of Posse Comitatus. The Military Commissions Act saw the end of habeas corpus. And the Real ID Act, attached to an emergency appropriations bill, passed with virtually no debate. Also passed during this time, and attributed to the need for tighter security, was the FISA Amendment Act which gave retroactive immunity to the major telecoms for their role in turning over massive amounts of cell and email communications to United States security agencies at their request. No warrant needed. Presidents have been set with regard to war, but what about other things? Many have said for years that there's a plot to move to a new world order, one world government. What if that were the plan? There have been several instances in the past where politicians and leaders have mentioned a plan for a new world order, but none so blatantly as England's Gordon Brown at the G20 summit held in London in April 2009. Brown summed up a portion of the meeting by saying, I think a new world order is emerging, and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. Your name is Tom. You live just off of 5th Street. Nice car, Tom. Nice house. What's not so nice is you owe Pennsylvania $4,212 in back taxes. Listen, Tom, we can make this easy. Pay online by June 18th, and we'll skip your penalty and take half off your interest. Because, Tom, we do know who you are. It's not a stretch of the imagination. In fact, it's already beginning to happen where people are being given RFID chips so that we can, you know, scan you. Now, they always try to present a good reason for doing that. Well, we'll have your entire medical history. If you fall down unconscious, the doctors will know who you are, what drugs you're allergic to. They'll be able to, to treat you more efficiently because they have all this information. Well, the opposite is also true. If the government has all this information on you, they can also manipulate you by the use of that information. Uh, you won't be allowed to get a job. You won't be allowed to buy food. You won't be able to, allowed to you know, perform any economic transactions unless you have the government RFID chip and are approved. Um, you know, this is, this is one of the things that people have been worried about for a long time. The technology now exists. In March 2010, the Obama administration declassified details about the Bush cybersecurity program. The program, initiated by National Security Presidential Directive 54, needs to evolve and become part of an even broader national cybersecurity strategy, according to President Obama. With the population concerned about intrusion, Obama has tried to assure Americans that the government will not monitor private sector networks and internet traffic, yet part of the program is to enhance awareness of network weaknesses and threats on the federal level to eventually include state, local, and even private sector. Wired reported what may be of the most concern, especially from an already over-intrusive government, is the need for government to define its roles in protecting private critical infrastructure networks. That infrastructure includes internet service providers, as well as telecommunications, banking, and other networks. It should be noted that the very governmental department that is responsible for cybersecurity, ASSERT, the United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team, has been found to have hundreds of holes within its own security system. In the report on the vulnerabilities, it states that the proper security measures have not been implemented on the mission operating environment that would protect data from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification, or destruction. It might be of interest to note that the agency, founded in 2003 and part of the Department of Homeland Security, 
is also considered a public-private partnership like the Federal Reserve. What is really worrying about a group like the Oath Keepers is this is a group of people who are armed by the rest of society. In the case of police officers, these are people who sometimes have the power of life and death over you or me. And what that means is if these men and women are animated by ideas that are completely false, completely paranoid and groundless, you've got to worry about who they're going to see as the real enemy and what kinds of decisions they make in stressful situations. When you look at the Oath Keepers website, the core of it is this uh, business about the orders they're not going to obey. Uh, and it starts out with a preamble, a quote from George Washington saying, you know, now is the time or soon comes the time uh, when uh, we'll, it will be determined whether we're slaves or freedmen. Immediately after that, uh, the Oath Keepers website says, presumably in Stuart Rhodes's uh, words, that that time is near at hand again. Southern Poverty Law Center. Heidi Byrick, one of my favorite people. She's a director of special projects. Had her on my radio show several times. And we enjoy each other's company. We, we talk, we have a good time, but she knows my position and she knows I understand hers. The reason that she is against Oath Keepers is because they made it clear that they wouldn't follow orders, really. Oath Keepers, uh, primarily former military people, are acknowledging this is what the Constitution says. We were trained as we went through uh, military training that it was our responsibility to deny an unconstitutional order. So presumably you'd have to be smart enough to know what was and was not a constitutional order. And so they have a list of 10 of them. Well, it's a declaration of orders, and, and the whole point of it is is to, um, one, draw some lines in the sand ahead of time and get the current serving military to think about where, you know, where their line in the sand is. Uh, but it's also a reflection of our own Bill of Rights. And so when, you re when I read through them, you'll see that, oh, okay, it's, it's mostly a restatement of the Bill of Rights. The first one is, is we will not obey orders to disarm the American people. And, of course, we had gun disarmament during Katrina. It was a big catalyst for why I started Oath Keepers. But it's also, you know, it's number one on our list, not because firearms and gun ownership is more important than any other part of the Bill of Rights or any, any other part of our natural rights, but it's because that's the one thing that's more likely to lead to fighting. Second one is, is we will not be orders to conduct warrantless searches of the American people. And what that's evoking is, once again, our Fourth Amendment, which was a response to the colonial history of the writs of assistance, which were warrantless searches or general warrants that the, one of, it's one of the first causes of resistance among the American population uh, back in 1763. And we will not uh, obey orders to detain American citizens as unlawful enemy combatants or to subject them by military tribunal. And the reason why that is there is that post 9-11 in particular, um, there has been a steady drumbeat and argument coming from the executive branch and backed up by the Supreme Court, unfortunately, that argues that the president can detain American citizens as unlawful combatants in the war on terror and treat them as though they were a foreign enemy, as though they were an Iraqi or an Afghani during the war on terror. So number four is we will not obey orders to impose martial law or a state of emergency on a state. And what this is is a reflection of, of, our, du of our dual sovereignty system. The Constitution sets up a new national government, but as the Tenth Amendment makes clear, reserves to the states and the people all powers not granted. And number five is we will not invade and subjugate any state that asserts its sovereignty. And that's closely related to number four. Because we have, under our Constitution, a dual sovereignty system reserving to the states and the people all powers not granted, um, that is part of the Constitution we all swore to defend. And so we will not use military force or obey orders to use military force against a state that is simply asserting its constitutionally respected sovereignty and standing on that and defending that principle. And number six is we will not obey orders to blockade American cities, thus turning them into giant detention camps. And this is something that, of course, you know, a lot of critics say, well, wait a minute, when's that ever going to happen? Well, it, it, historically that happened in, in the Warsaw ghettos. And that's one of the things that we've done is, is say, look, not only do we have the history that the founders um, reflected in our Bill of Rights, but we also have the 20th century experience, what was done by the Nazis, was done by Stalin and his gulags. And one of the things the Nazis did is that they cordoned off 
a large section of Warsaw and detain the Jews there and use that as a detention center. All they had to do was blockade it off and, and post armed guards and post concertina wire around it and then they starved them out. They tried to starve them to death. Okay, number seven is we will not obey orders to force Americans into any form of detention camp under any pretext. And this is once again a reflection of our own experience in the 20th century. Uh, as we saw what happened in Nazi Germany, as we saw what happened in Stalinist Russia, uh, as we saw what happened with, with Pol Pot in Cambodia, you had people who were, were forced into detention centers. And even in our own history, the sad history during World War II of American, of American citizens of Japanese descent being rounded up, over 100,000 of them were interned in detention camps in California, Arizona, Oregon, and Washington State. And this was done by executive order by FDR and it was carried out uh, by the military generals, General DeWitt on the Western Command, of the Western Command. And so we had that precedent, even in our own history. Number eight is we will not obey any orders to use foreign troops on U.S. soil to keep the peace or maintain control. And the reason why this is, this is on this list is in the founders' experience, it was the use of foreign mercenaries, the Hessians, um, which was one of the more grievous affronts and led to the Declaration of Independence, quite frankly. Um, they had, even during the fighting after, after April 19, 1775, there was still hope they could reconcile and, and remain part of the British Empire. But when they, the Crown used foreign troops on them, that's when they drew a line and said, this is just so outrageous. It's one of the reasons why they separated. Number nine is we will not obey orders to confiscate the property of the American people, including food and other essential supplies. And once again, this is, this is a, a uh, recognition and reflection of the fact that denial of food has been used as a weapon uh, in warfare for, for thousands of years. It's also a reflection of the asserted authority of the president to confiscate property and confiscate food. Um, there have been many executive orders since the Cold War that assert this supposed power of the president to go and seize industries and seize supplies. And even had Truman seizing the uh, steel mills during the Korean War, as it actually happened. And that was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court only because Congress had expressly declared that he couldn't do that. But it left open, wherever Congress has not said no, it's left open an open question about whether a president can do these things. And so it almost, almost uh, affirmed that he can, under some circumstances, go and seize entire industries. Uh, number 10 is we will not obey orders to infringe on the people's right to assembly, to freedom of speech, freedom of association, and freedom of religion, which is simply a reflection of our First Amendment protected uh, guarantees of our rights to assemble and petition government for disagreements and freedom of speech and assembly. Um, these are every bit as important as anything else. And even though it's number 10, it's as important as number one. If you don't have freedom of speech and assembly, then you no longer have any peaceful recourse whatsoever um, for correction of government abuse. We have quite a few who have joined. Out of 10,000 uh, current members we have right now, a fair number are active duty. But a lot of them are kind of staying under the radar because they're concerned about being purged or persecuted. And so I always tell them, don't worry. I don't care if you officially join or not. The main thing is you keep your oath. It's there as the antidote against obedience, blind obedience to the man on the white horse, whether he be a general, whether he be a president, whoever he is. And they understood that people would be tempted to go along and just do as they're told. This is just the, the tendency of men in uniform. So the oath is there as an antidote to make sure that it reminds them of their obligations. Governments are notorious for creating panic to get public support for legislation and emergency measures that the population would not otherwise consider. The United States government is no different. Whether it concerns war with other nations, battling a disaster in our own country, or control over the population during natural or health emergencies, governments instill fear to coerce the population to give up their rights in order to cooperate. The mainstream media is complicit in exciting panic among the people as well. The media's role during the H1N1 flu scare was clear. Swine flu normally infects pigs, but this virus is a new strain. These are a new swine influenza virus. They're new for pigs and they are new for people. The plans are already in place to force the non-compliant public to cooperate. You can be removed from your home by force if necessary, mandatorily quarantined and vaccinated against your will. 
Your children can be removed from schools and taken to safe yet undisclosed locations until it is deemed safe for their return. This is all under the guise of protecting our nation. What has happened to our free country? Little by little, we are losing our constitutional rights, yet most Americans are paying little or no attention. People do not understand that these egregious powers are not being proposed. They are already in place, ready for federal, state, or local officials to act upon during a state of emergency. You will not get a say. You will lose your freedom to speak out. You will lose your right to privacy as troops force their way into your home to search without a warrant. You will lose your right to be secure in your home, even if you have plenty of supplies and are prepared to stay. You will lose your right to be armed as troops go door to door, person to person, confiscating your legally owned firearms. You will see military in the streets of this country carrying out the will of an unrestrained government as they round up free U.S. citizens. Some state governments pass measures to forcibly quarantine residents, incarcerate those who refuse to be vaccinated, and to forcibly vaccinate your children. Legislation like this passed during the much-hyped H1N1 flu outbreak. Training has already occurred to carry out many of these measures. Reminiscent of the forcing from their homes and the internment of U.S. citizens during World War II, all of this has already happened on U.S. soil. How will you be able to defend your family? How will you react when they cart your children off to an undisclosed location because the government thinks it can protect your children better than you? Will your family's survival be up to you or will it be up to an out of control government and its alphabet agencies, most of which have failed the American people over and over again? Are you going to blindly follow a government that has shown time and time again it has no respect for your constitutional rights? These rights are inalienable. They cannot be taken, and we cannot give them up. Yet Congress and various administrations encroach on our rights all the time. Will you give up your family willingly? Will you voluntarily become a captive of one of these quarantine or detention camps? What will you do? Will you go quietly? This is the total federalization slash internationalization with this huge control grid that is meant to protect the establishment from the people as they expand their tyranny. Because they expect for you to resist them as this corruption expands, as a rebellion forms against this Hitlerian takeover. And you're going to be named, you're going to be listed as a terrorist because you don't submit to them and become their slave. It's all happening, lights, cameras, action Face scanning cameras, watch reactions And a gate of your walk, no diddy bapping What you thought is the state of New York we trapped in And I'ma tell you something that's scary at least Not Al-Qaeda, our military police Right here in the beast, got sound weapons that blare in your face To wear masks and tear gas, you to stay in your place Yo, it's weird, there's no awareness in America today States declare martial law and they don't care if you safe They got food for y'all, genetically engineered for your race Probably swine flu, stupid Old American taste, yo, it's cool, they cherish, I would perish away. And on the package, small letters that say USA, FDA approved, and that plan parent for free. It has no adverse reactions, apparently. See, my country wants to harm me and disarm me with its army. They're gonna come in them home fees when they want me, this country. My country wants to harm me and disarm me with its army. They're gonna come in them Humvees when they want me, this country. But we can't let them win, cause my country wants to harm me and disarm me with its army. They're gonna come in them Humvees when they want me, this country. My country wants to harm me and disarm me with its army. They're gonna come in them Humvees when they want me, this country.